Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Welcome back to our series on presidential assassinations, where we're looking at unsuccessful and successful attempts to take out a president. In the last episode, I talked about the psychology that goes behind would-be presidential assassins, how many of them are failed upstarts in life and trying to seek a shortcut to glory. There are surprisingly few people who are motivated just by politics and ideology. Usually, there's a little bit of that, but it's politics and ideology mixed in with mental illness and a desperate desire for notoriety. We also looked at attempts on the life of Franklin D. Roosevelt in the last episode and how there were many near misses. If it hadn't been for a few things going a different way or for a bullet traveling two feet to the left or to the right, FDR could have very well been assassinated in office. Like any president, there were hundreds if not thousands of death threats against him, and some people got surprisingly close. In this episode, we're going to look at JFK. Why was he successfully assassinated? Was it because the Cold War was heating up and due to tensions with the Soviet Union, there were more attempts on his life? Was it simply dumb luck? Was it something else? Well, here are a few quotes from JFK and people close to him that might shed some light on this before we get into the subject in detail. JFK once said to author Jim Bishop, If anyone wants to do it, no amount of protection is enough. All a man needs is a willingness to trade his life for mine. He also said, I guess there is always the possibility of assassination, but that is what the Secret Service is for. I guess that is one of the less desirable aspects of the presidency. And another time, Secret Service Chief James Rowley, who was in a conversation with author Jim Bishop, said, I counted 50 coincidences caused the assassination. If just one of them had happened the other way. So what he's saying is that, there was a perfect storm of bad things happening that allowed the assassination against JFK to be successful, and if just one of them had been removed, he very well could have lived. So according to a Secret Service chief, it was dumb luck. It wasn't some sort of flare-up of ideology. Well, let's get into more of his story and see if we can make sense of this. And interestingly enough, before he was assassinated, JFK was curious about the way assassination could affect a president's legacy. He asked Princeton historian David Donald if Lincoln would have been rated as such a great president and been on Mount Rushmore if he had not been killed. Donald replied that it was unlikely, since Lincoln's reputation would ultimately have suffered while tackling the problems of post-Civil War Reconstruction. And many have argued that JFK and his legacy received a halo effect because of his assassination. Well, he was a little bit cavalier about his protection. In 1960, following his election as President of the United States, JFK told one of his aides that Secret Service protection was excessive and he was not at risk. He said, they're making me uncomfortable. Nobody is going to shoot me, so tell them to relax. He also joked about being assassinated, according to his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy. She remembered JFK saying, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, well, if anyone's going to shoot me, this would be the day they should do it. He also joked about assassination with a Secret Service detail. Once, when he left a church, JFK crouched lower and lower as he said to his agents, There is anyone up there in that choir loft trying to get me? They're going to have to get you first. On two other occasions, President Kennedy predicted that he might become a target for would-be assassins. On the morning of November 22, 1963, Kennedy told Kenneth O'Donnell, If anyone really wanted to shoot the President of the United States, It was not a very difficult job. All one had to do was get in a high building someday with a telescopic rifle, and there was nothing anyone could do to defend against such an attempt. That same morning, he said to his wife, We're heading into nut country today, which is Dallas. You know, last night would have been a hell of a night to assassinate a president. I mean it. There was the rain and the night. We were all getting jostled. Suppose a man had a pistol and a briefcase. Then he could have dropped the gun and the briefcase and melted away in the crowd. The night before JFK's trip to Dallas, Senator Hubert H. Humphrey, who Lyndon Johnson would select as his 1964 vice presidential running mate, gave a speech in which he spoke of threats and assassination and warned that the act of an emotionally unstable person or irresponsible citizen can strike down a great leader. In August 1961, 
James Rowley succeeded U.E. Bowman as Secret Service Chief, and Gerald A. Benn was appointed head of JFK's Secret Service Detail. Benn joined the Secret Service in 1939 and was assigned to the White House in 1941. In 1946, he was promoted to the leadership of one of the three shifts that guarded the president. At the time of their appointments, the agency had 536 permanent positions, including office workers and other non-agents. Most of them were scattered across the nation in the agency's 60 field offices. In 1963, the White House detail consisted of 36 special agents. In addition, there were six special agent drivers, eight special agents assigned to the Kennedy family, and five special officers detailed to the Kennedy home in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. On the fated trip to Dallas, Texas, there were 28 special agents in the presidential entourage. While the number of Secret Service agents increased during JFK's tenure in the White House, training them was apparently not a priority. Former agent Larry Newman remembered that, On my second day on the job as an agent, they put me in the rear seat of the president's limousine. A supervisor on the detail placed a Thompson submachine gun on my lap, or a Tommy gun. I had never seen a Thompson, much less used one. In the first six weeks of the Kennedy presidency, the threatening mail increased by 300%. During Kennedy's first year in office, the Secret Service investigated 870 threatening letters, and White House police turned away 643 callers seeking to see the president about grievances. The figures were 50% higher than the final years of Eisenhower's presidency. The agency viewed the increase in threats as alarming. Well, the Secret Service, in light of this, was worried about the Kennedy family's active lifestyle. After he was elected president, Kennedy was briefed by Secret Service Chief Bowman, who told him not to leave his protectors behind at any point. According to Secret Service agent Gerald Blaine, JFK was a challenge to protect, especially in a motorcade. Kennedy liked to stand up in an open-top car, wave to the crowds, and get out and shake hands. Kennedy often plunged into crowds with little warning. Technically, Secret Service Chief James Rowley had the authority to forbid JFK from taking a walk, and he could also tell him where to fish and where to take a vacation and veto a visit to a foreign country. But as the Secret Service served at the pleasure of the president, such authority was practically useless, and agents had to accommodate themselves to the president's wishes. Nevertheless, his agents were shocked at the way Kennedy put his life in danger during his assignations with women. The president once escaped his detail during a visit to New York's Carlisle Hotel. He returned around midnight and asked his agents, Is there anything you'd like to talk about? And they didn't think it was very funny. In the late 1990s, Seymour Hersh interviewed Secret Service men who were members of the president's protected detail. One of the agents, Larry Newman, was appalled at Kennedy's affairs with numerous women. He was also embarrassed when high-priced prostitutes were brought to JFK's hotel suite in Seattle in November 1961. Newman tried to stop them, but presidential aide Dave Powers intervened to usher the women right in. One of the local police officers asked Newman, Does this go on all the time? Newman replied, Well, we travel during the day. This only happens at night. Newman said it was highly frustrating because we thought so much of the guy. We didn't know if these women were carrying listening devices, if they had syringes that carried some type of poison, or if they had Pentax cameras that would photograph the president for blackmail. Newman blamed JFKA David Powers for the lack of security. Former agent Marty Venker was also disillusioned at the way JFK conducted himself. He said agents were expected to set up JFK with dates. If an agent was new to the job, Venker said, and wasn't aware of this fact, Kennedy would let him know pretty quickly. He'd say something to the effect of, You've been here two weeks already and still don't have any broads lined up for me? You guys get all the broads you want. How about doing something for your commander-in-chief? When New York call girl Leslie Devereaux visited JFK at the White House, an agent took her to the Lincoln bedroom. When she expressed concern that she had to lie down on Lincoln's bed, the agent told her, Lady, it's the best we've got. There were a number of scares during the Kennedy years that turned out to be innocuous, but nevertheless made Secret Service agents nervous. On November 4th, when Kennedy was campaigning in Chicago, Police arrested two men, 23-year-old Puerto Rican Jaime Cruz Alejandro and 61-year-old African-American minister Israel Dabney, who separately approached the Democratic presidential candidate armed with pistols. Both men were arrested and charged with a misdemeanor for carrying a concealed weapon. 
Both men denied having any intent to harm Kennedy. Typical of the non-serious threats was the case of taxi driver Stanley Berman, who received a ticket to attend the president's inaugural ball from one of his fairs. Berman rented a tuxedo, hopped on a bus to Washington, and strolled into the armory. Someone mistook him for a member of the Kennedy family and showed him to a seat in the presidential box. On his left was the president's father, Joseph Kennedy. Berman was there long enough to have his photo taken with Kennedy Sr. before someone realized the error. I was sitting there, Berman said, when three Secret Service agents surrounded me. One looked at his wristwatch and told me quietly, There's been some mistake. You have one minute to get out of this building and off the grounds. The first real threat to President Kennedy's life occurred when he was president-elect. On Sunday morning, December 11, 1960, 73-year-old Richard Pavlik, a former postal worker from Belmont, New Hampshire, parked his Buick directly in front of Kennedy's sprawling, Mediterranean-style mansion in Palm Beach, Florida. Pavlik, dressed in a dark blue suit coat, had packed himself with dynamite that could be exploded by flicking a switch wire to a small dry cell battery in his trouser pocket. Pavlik's intention was to smash his car into the Kennedy limousine, press a dynamite switch, and kill everyone, including himself. The dynamite was sufficient, the Secret Service later said, to have blown up a small mountain. Pavlik carried a note that said he intended to kill Kennedy because he believed he had bought the presidency. He also carried a note apologizing for any bystanders killed or hurt by his assassination attempt and said that if Kennedy had not been elected president, he would instead have targeted Jimmy Hoffa, president of the Teamsters Union. Richard Pavlik was known as a bitter and angry man with no family who lived in a three-room bungalow and had once disputed a water bill with a water company with a gun in his hand. The day after JFK's election, Pavlik confided to friends that life had lost all meaning to him. He talked of destroying himself and taking down others with him. At one time, he disappeared for a few days. When he came back, Postmaster Thomas Murphy said, he told me he had been to Hyannis Port. He told me the Secret Service agents were stupid. At the time, I was busy and didn't pay attention. Later, I got to wondering why a man who was so opposed to Kennedy would make a trip to Hyannis Port to see him. In the middle of November 1960, Pavlik had turned over the proceeds from his property, about $2,000, to the Spalding News Center in Northfield, New Hampshire. He placed his belongings in his Buick, and then he vanished. Frequently, postcards from Pavlik addressed to various townspeople would arrive at Belmont's local post office. The cards told of how the town's residents would soon hear about Pavlik in a big way. The cards indicated, according to Secret Service investigation, that Pavlik was following Kennedy's travels. So if Kennedy was in St. Louis giving a speech, Postmaster Murphy said, somebody would get a postcard from Pavlik there. And if the president was in San Diego, the card would come from there. According to the Secret Service, Pavlik had also visited Hyannis Port and come within 10 to 20 feet of Senator Kennedy. Pavlik had photographed Kennedy's home in Hyannis Port, noted his security arrangements, and later, in Palm Beach, taking photos of the church the Kennedys attended. He also studied the layout of the church, attending at least once when JFK was there. In early December 1960, Thomas Murphy became highly suspicious. He called the local police and characterized Pavlik as probably insane. Belmont police passed on the information to the Secret Service, which received the report on December 9th, two days before Pavlik turned up at the Palm Beach Kennedy mansion. Agents arrived in Belmont and interviewed locals, but did not issue an all-points alert for him. As Pavlik waited outside Kennedy's Palm Beach mansion, he saw the president-elect emerge from the house with his wife and young children. Kennedy got into the car while his wife and children waited for him to drive away. Pavlik hesitated. He later said that he decided not to throw the switch on the bomb because he didn't wish to harm Jacqueline or the children. Pavlik decided to try to get Kennedy at the church or somewhere else. When the president left his house on the way to St. Edward's Church, Pavlik followed. As JFK took a pew, Pavlik walked toward him. Agent Gerald Blaine followed the would-be assassin, took his arm by the elbow, and gently pulled him back. Blaine led him to the church entrance, and after a few minutes, Pavlik walked out and got into his car. Blaine noted the registration number, then notified Palm Beach Police. As Kennedy left the church, the congregation cut around the president-elect and his guards, and lined up along the path to the limousine. Pavlik found himself surrounded by men, women, and children. Rather than risk harming a child, Pavlik abandoned his 